If you have your Bibles this morning, turn to the New Testament, to the book of Colossians, chapter 3. Colossians, chapter 3. We're going to talk this morning about starting right. Starting right. Now, I never, I was in track years ago, but I was not a runner. Most of you know my philosophy about running. Only two people need to run the thief and the cop chasing him. Okay? So I've not been a runner. I ran, I mean, when you play sports, you run, but um, football and basketball and tennis and all that stuff. But, um, uh, just to go out and run someplace, um, never, never did that. But they tell you if you're in track that the fr- right here in this picture, the starting process is make it or break it time right here. Getting off the blocks quick, doing it right, and getting down the track is very, very important. So I kind of want you to think about that today. I want that to be a picture in your mind. Because as this new year begins, uh, there's some of us, I'm sure, that are thinking, you know, last year I wanted to do A, B, and C, and I only got A done, or I wanted to do whatever, and I want to strive uh, to do better with my goals and my agendas and so on and so forth. And um, I'm not asking you to make a goal today. I'm asking you to change. Some people say the hardest place to get change is in church. Unless you have the offering plate, then it's an easy place to get change. That's a joke. A poll shows that 41% of the Americans make um, New Year's resolutions. Now, I'm not going to ask you if you did, but if you made a New Year's resolution and one of them was to be in church, you made it today, praise God. So you only got, you know, 51 more to go. You'd be good. So anyway... But 41% of the Americans make resolutions, and at the end of the year, 9% have kept their resolution. Now, I want you to think about that for a moment because, first of all, uh, only 41% admitted they did, and only 9% uh, admitted that they or, or thought they completed them. So the numbers could be very much skewed in a lot of ways. Uh, obviously, this is the time of year a lot of people do a lot of things as far as planning Uh, to the new year, but I kind of joked about it with some people this morning that the only thing that changed between yesterday and today was the clock. You get what I'm getting at? And so if you were up last night at midnight and watched the straight midnight, well, God bless you, I was long gone by then. And I gave up that a long time ago because I noticed something about staying up till midnight. Uh, It didn't change anything. So I, I, I was tired last night, I went to bed. But anyway, so in order to be different at the end of this year, I'm talking spiritually different because my goal for myself, my goal for our church or our goal as a church should be, and your goal for each one of you should be at the end of this coming year, 2023, if the Lord tarries, I am different than I am this morning. Okay, it's, it's ridiculous if you were to say, I have made a resolution, I'm going to lose weight. And so you weigh yourself this morning and you weigh whatever it is. And then at the end of the year, you've lost one pound. Would you count that as a win? Probably not. But when we think spiritually, a lot of times that's exactly what we do. We, you know, like, I have a goal spiritually. I want to do this. I want to do that. I want to be different spiritually than I was at the beginning of the year. But at the end of the year, when we actually sit down and are honest with ourselves, we realize we haven't changed at all. If we have, it's such a small amount, it doesn't really make a difference. <clears throat> In order to change, we must begin right. Start right. And that's why we're going to talk about that from the book of Colossians this morning. Um, it, Col- Colossians, well, I say this all the time. It's just another amazing book, okay? I'll put it that way to you. Uh, so we're going to, Paul gives us some instruction here. He wasn't writing this for New Year's Day. I'll grant you that right up front. But what he's telling us here is that there's really two ways to live. And one way is the world's way, and the other is God's way. And if we live the world's way, all we do is wander around, and we we don't really achieve anything. We don't really get anything done. Have you ever 
seeing someone uh, when they're working, they, they, they're busy, but they really don't accomplish anything. Um, as I get older, what I find myself doing is when I change rooms, I get involved in another project and forgot the first project. Then I go back and I'm like, oh, yeah, I got to do that project. Okay, I don't know about the rest of you, but uh, that's what I find myself doing. Um, I do that sometimes when I'm studying for sermons, to be honest with you. I'm working on something, and next thing I know, I'm working on something that's not going to come for a couple months, but I'm still working on it because I just, you know, I wanted to get on that for a while. But anyway, um, in the beginning of this chapter, Paul uh, uh, writes to us here in verse 1, If then you have been raised with Christ. I want you to notice the first word, if, meaning that who, he's, who is he writing to? He's writing to believers, okay? Writing to believers. He says, if you then have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are, are above as I seek your face. That's why we sang the song this morning. Seek the things which are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death. If you're one of those people who like to write in your Bible, right there, put kill. K-I-L-L, -L, because it's exactly what it means. Kill. Kill, therefore, what is earthly in you. What is fleshly in you. What your body what your body, what your mind wants to do that is against God. And he lists a number of things here. Now, be careful. Be careful. I don't want you to look at this list and say, I don't do any of those things because this is not an exhaustive list. This isn't like everything that, that Paul is going to, you know, that Paul is dealing with. He's talking about anything uh, that is earthly in you. Look at verse 5. Put to death, kill what is earthly in you. And he lists some things, sexual immorality, Impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Killed it. For on account of these, the wrath of God is coming. You're going to stand in judgment. In these you once too walked. In other words, that's who you were at one time. Before we come to Jesus, that's who we were. When you were living in them. But now you must put them all away. And he begins to make another list. Again, not exhaustive. Anger, wrath, malice, slander. An obscene talk from your mouth. Oh, I don't curse. Do you gossip? Do you talk about other people? Do you lie? That's all obscene talk. Verse 9, do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices. Paul says, that's what you used to do. That's the way you live. That's what's normal for you. But you supposedly got rid of that because back up in verse 1, then if you've been raised with Christ, then you shouldn't be living like this. And you have put on, verse 10, the new self, which is being renewed, revived, renewed in knowledge after the Im image of its creator. Here there is not Greek or Jew or circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Well, we could spend a couple weeks right there, but we're actually going to cover the whole chapter today. So we got to get moving or we're not going to get that done. If we are going to be different at the end of the year than we are at the beginning of the year, we've got to change. I already started out by telling you that we've got to change. And in some of your Bibles, the heading on this chapter, if you have a Bible that has a heading, it may say something like, put on the new self or or uh, put on uh, put away the old self either one of those uh, but if it's a po if it's thinking more positive it's put on the new self I want you to know it's impossible to put away the old self if you don't have the new self there are people every day that are trying to change without Jesus and guess what they get nothing we need Jesus to change us and that's why verse one starts out with if then you have been raised with Christ. Paul says, you know what? He's talking to a church, the Colossians, and he says, listen, if you've been changed, if you are a child of God, let me just talk to you about some things that needs to happen. And he begins to talk here about those things. And so the first thing I want us to notice this morning is that we need to change direction. 
change direction. You know, if anything in your life today that you want to change in the new year, you've got to change direction. Let me give you an illustration. If you're addicted to eating, then you don't go to buffets this year. I'm being a little sarcastic, but I'm being realistic too. I, have, I just noticed this week I got an invitation to Shady Maple for a meeting at Shady Maple Smorgasbord. Thinking that's probably the last place I need to go. <laughs> you can't diet there. Uh, I should see what day it is because every day is a different menu. Maybe it's something I, I like fish or something. I don't know. But anyway, we need to change direction. What I mean by changing direction is not turning a little bit, but turning around. Not, not changing just a little bit of our thought process and our behavior and our attitude. Paul doesn't say here in these verses that we just read that you just need to change a few little things. He says you've got to kill it. None of us really want to think about killing it because that means we've got to get rid of it. It's over. Well, let's see what he says we should change. Verse 1, then if you've been raised, if... Seek the things that are above, which is Christ seated on the reign of God. We need to change our focus. What has your attention? What has your attention? Just think about it in your own life. Don't think about your spouse. Don't think about your kids. Think about you. What has your attention? What eats up your time? What are you focused on? Paul says here in verse 1, if we have been raised, if we're believers, we need to seek things from above, which is Christ. Because he's there seated on the right hand of the Father. As Christians, our, our focus needs to be on him, not on the things uh, of the world, not on the world. You know, I know people that are addicted to the news. That's a problem. If we're addicted to anything besides Jesus, it's a problem. I know people addicted to food. I, can, I have no problem with eating, okay? I know people addicted to alcohol and drugs and all this other all this stuff we get addicted to. And, you know, if we're going to get rid of any of that, if we're going to change our thought process, we've got to change our focus. People are addicted to work. People are addicted to play. There are people that make more of a habit of making sure they work out X number of times a week than they are about being in church. And yet they'll tell you they're a Christian. Number two, or letter B, we need to change our minds. Look at verses two through four. Set your minds on things that are above. You know, the Bible, if you want to look at an interesting study, I've been studying on it for over a year now, and you might want to dig into it. Just, just Google, go to your Bible program and, and put in the word mind and start reading how many times the Bible talks about your mind. God realized our mind was going to be a problem. We need to change our minds. Paul says, set them on things that are above, not things that are on earth. Why? Why did Paul say that? You know, the things of the earth aren't bad. It could be worse, but, you know, why? Well, look at verse 3. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. You are different than who you used to be. When Christ, who is your life, appears, and you will appear with him in glory. Paul says, you know, you need to change your minds. Your old thinking process needs to go away. He says, we need to change our desires, verses 5 through 7. He says, put to death, I told you, kill. Therefore, what is earthly in you? And he lists those things. In verse 7, he says, in these you used to walk, but you shouldn't be walking in them anymore because you're a believer. Change your desires. You say, well, I can't really think of any desires I have that are bad. If they're not based on God, if they're not of God, they're bad. They don't have to be illegal to be bad. If they draw you away from the Lord, they're bad. We need to change our desires. He says, fourthly, to change our behavior. Verses 8 through 11. He says, you need to put this stuff away. And he lists all these things. And he says, you've got to put off that old practice. Just because you've always done that doesn't make it right. Verse 10. And then he tells us to put on the new self because Christ is all in all. We need to change our behavior. Now, I could stop there this morning. We'd go home and we'd have a hard time working on those four things. But Paul's not done. In verses 12 through 13, he says we need to change our living. 
change our living. And he lists things here, four of those things I want to point out to you. First of all, we are to live virtuously. Look at verse 12. Put on. Now he says, get rid of all that junk, kill it. Now he says, put on. I want you to think about a jacket or a coat or a sweater. That's, I always try to illustrate it that way because when he says to take it off, it's just like you taking off a coat and getting rid of it. And when he says put it on, it's just the same exact thing. He's saying take this and put it on. It will replace what you killed. Look what he says, verse four, 12. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. He tells us who we are, God's chosen ones. We're holy and we're beloved. We're holy through Christ. He says, beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Put those things on. Bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving one another. In verse 14, above all these, put on love. So he lists here in these couple of verses, uh, you know, three major things. One uh, or four we should put on. He lists the things to put on. He says uh, we need to bear with one another. That means we come alongside of one another. I praise God. Some of you people in our church are wonderful, compassionate people who come alongside of other people and you show humility and kindness and all those things he lists there because you help one another. Sometimes I don't even know about it. Sometimes I find out, praise God. You don't have to, you don't have to broadcast it. You just got to do it. Amen. Sometimes broadcasting it rips, it takes away your, your, uh, your blessing. Bearing with one another. He says, forgiving one another, forgiving one another. Why do we have to forgive one another? Because we're the body of Christ. And the Lord has forgiven us, he says in verse 13. And so because the Lord has forgiven us, he, look at the wording, you must forgive. Must forgive. In verse 14, he says, put on love. Why? Because it binds everything together in perfect harmony. When you're really in love with God and you're really in love with each other, you know what? All the garbage is, it, it just goes away because... You're just trying to love on people and help people and serve people. So we need to live virtuously. Second of all, in verse 15, tells us we need, need to live peacefully. We need to live peacefully. Verse 15, let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. You know what that means? It means exactly what it says, that the peace of Christ needs to be in charge. Let it rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body. When you, when you go back to verse 1, when you were raised in Christ, he says you've been, you've been given the peace of Christ in your heart. You were called into that one body. And he says you should be thankful about that. And you know, I was thinking to myself, I wonder how often we praise God and thank him for just being part of the body of Christ. And Paul says here that we, we have that peace of Christ because it's been given to us. And we're part of that body, and we're to be thankful. Being peaceful is, is the opposite of being anxious and scared and fearful and all that other stuff. And yet, eight times in the New Testament, the Bible talks about us not being anxious. When we're anxious, we can't live peaceably. We can't live peacefully because in our lives, we, we're anxious about everything. Thirdly, in verse 16, he tells us to live abidingly. Look what it says. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. We should look like a little Bible with feet. Years ago, in vacation Bible school, we had a person dressed up as a Bible. And they walked around during vacation Bible school, and they looked like this Bible. You know, seriously, that's what we should look like as believers. We should look like little Bibles because we live abiding in the word. Look what he lists here in verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. In other words, just completely fill you up because uh, it teaches you and it admonishes you and, and all wisdom. It gives you the wisdom you need. And then he says, sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thanksgiving in your hearts to God. When that word of God becomes permanent in our lives, when it becomes something we're abiding in and we, we can't live without, if you go through a whole day and then you remember at the end of the day, oh, I didn't read my Bible, uh, shame on us. We should be like, uh, before I get this day started, I need to get in the word of God. And if we do that and we get in the word of God and it becomes part of our life, the closer we get to him, uh, the result then is, uh, he gets our, re uh, our attention. We're looking to him. He gets our response. When, when we 
find something in our life, somebody that's nasty to us, a job situation that goes south, whatever, we, we immediately respond and consider him because he is abiding in us. Can't help but take you back to verse 1. You've been raised in Christ. Seek the things from above. That's what we should be living abidingly. Verse 17 says we should live thankfully. Whatever you do, whatever you do, whether you say it or you do it, he says whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. Everybody knows what everything means, right? Everything. You know, even when it's going south, we're to do it thankfully. We're to give thanks to God, the Father, through Christ. He says right here in verse 17, do it all. It's interesting, in three, three verses here that we just read, three times Paul has talked about giving praise, being thankful. Verses 15, 16, and 17. He's talking about being thankful. Do you think thankful, being thankful is important? What have we learned about things when it's repeated in Scripture? It's there for emphasis. He's trying to drive us home. He's trying to hit us with a stick and remind us that we are to be thankful because we're a bunch of boneheads. And the closer we get to God through his word, the more we are thankful for God in his word. Number three, we need to change our practices. So we've changed our direction. We're to change our living, and we need to change our practices, how we live. First of all, ladies that are wives, says, submit to your husbands as fitting in the Lord. So wives, submit. I know every time we talk about this, it gets, the, <laughs> gets people uptight sometimes. I want to make sure we're clear on the subject. This is not the idea of being inferior to, to your husband. That's not what it means at all. But it means honoring your husband's position, honoring his responsibilities, honoring his authority under God in the position that God has given him as the head of the house. That's what it means. It's kind of the idea of a president and vice president working together. Okay? And so... Uh, he says, wives, if we're, gonna, if we're going to uh, start right, we need to change our direction, we need to change our living, and we need to change our practice, and wives need to submit. There are, there are moral limits. We see them right here in the scripture. It says, as is fitting to the Lord. Okay? So the Lord puts guidelines there. Uh, she's not, wife, uh, is not obligated uh, to follow her husband's leadership if it conflicts with God's word. She's not obligated to follow her husband's leadership if it conflicts with the law of the land, okay? Uh, the moral, uh, the moral uh, laws of the word or the word of God, it, she's not, not obligated to do that, but otherwise she is supposed to be submissive. Okay, so all you guys are like, oh, that's great. Wait till I talk to my wife. Shut up because here comes ours. Husband's love. Pretty simple. Do you know there's no place in scripture where wives are commanded to love their husbands? <laughs> he got quiet. Okay, but we are, we are commanded in Scripture, guys, to love our wives. Right here's the first play, or one of the places. Husbands, love your wives. Underline All men, underline that in your Bible. Seriously, you need to know that. You need to love your wife, okay? Uh, and it goes on and explains uh, a little bit more about that. It says, and do not be harsh with her or with them. Okay, first of all, I want you to know, wives, you're to submit to your husband. And husbands, you are to love your wife. Okay, and it says here uh, not to be harsh with them. The word harsh there in the original text means to make bitter, make bitter. In other words, you do things that just make them bitter. And I've seen men do that. Christian men, supposedly in church, thinking you're not the smartest, you know, you're not the sharpest pen in the, in the, in the bucket here. Love your wives. Ephesians, Paul writes, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. Okay, here's a step up. In Ephesians, Paul says, you should love your wife as, as your own body. Because he who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh. I have never seen a man be arrested because he beat the tar out of himself. But every day there's a spousal abuse going on where the man beats up a woman or even a woman beats up the man. 
But when we get married, we should love our spouse just as if that's, that, that's mine. I, I'm part of her. And then, ladies, he's part of you. There shouldn't be no abuse because we're to love each other. Husbands are supposed to love their wives like they love their own body. Verse 29 of Ephesians says, For one either hateth his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it. So just as Christ does the church. We are commanded here, guys, to love our wife as Christ loved the church. Now let me ask you, how much did Jesus love the church? Yeah, see what Bill just did? That much. He died for it. He died, well, I wouldn't die for my wife. What? Then you don't love her. We're to, we're to be willing to die for our wives. Someone has said, wives like tender and sensitive flowers may wilt under dominance, but will blossom with tender, loving care. Let me explain that a little bit easier. You plant flowers in your flower bed, and you walk on them, they're going to die. You carry a little water out to them every once in a while and make sure they get the sun on them, they'll grow. Our job, men, is to make sure our wives are growing every day. So you're not a husband and you're not a wife, and you're like, that's good, I'm not covered. Children, obey. We've got to change our practices. Wives, you need to change. Husbands, you need to change. Children, you need to change. Children, obey your parents in everything. For this pleases the Lord. Now, there's obviously, you, the children aren't to obey you if you teach, you're training them to break in the stores and steal stuff and, you know, whatever, uh, or anything against the word of God. But in the Old Testament, to disobey your parents was considered an act of disobeying God. And depending on what the disobedience was, they could be stoned. Your kid could be taken outside the camp and stoned. Now, I know some of you are like, I wish it was today. But no, it isn't. Okay? But children are to obey. We, you know, we are to obey our parents as long as our parents are living. And we are, you know, we are to obey. Uh, and uh, because we shouldn't be under the discipline of God for disobedience. And if you want to, you say, well, I don't really know if that's exactly. Well, in um, Luke chapter 2, verse 51, there's an example of the Son of God obeying his parents. The very one we celebrated last week, Jesus Christ coming from heaven to earth. Amen? The Son of God, it says in Luke chapter 2, verse 51, Jesus was submissive to them, talking about his parents. If it's good enough for Jesus, it's definitely good enough for us. The Bible tells us in that text that if we obey our parents, then everything displeases God. Think about it. When you obey your parents, when the kids obey you, and parents, I'm going to tell you something. If you let your kids run all over you, you're planning something that somebody's going to hate you for. And it doesn't please God. So we have husbands and wives and children and now parents. Parent. Parents, parent. Look at verse 21. Fathers, do not provoke your children. It, it, in, it's talking about the house. Mothers and fathers. Do not provoke your children unless they become discouraged. When we parent, you need to realize when you're disciplining your child, when you're encouraging your child, when you're blessing your child, when you're helping your child, you are a representative of God. And you know what? I have heard many, many times in my, in my time as a pastor where people have come to me and said, I had the worst dad, he was abusive, blah, 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 all this stuff. And you know what? They struggle every day because their dad was a bad dad or their mom was a bad mom. Listen, parents, don't be a bad dad or a bad mom because you're sowing something that's going to it's going to be reaped for generations, maybe. And he says here, fathers, do not provoke children. Parents, don't provoke your children unless they become discouraged. Verse uh, 4 of chapter 6 of Ephesians, this, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. You know, when you do things that just agitate your kids, you know, you say, well, my parents agitated them because they kept saying no. I'm not talking about no. I'm talking about parents who abuse their kids by 
manipulating them and doing things to them just to agitate them. Don't do it. We should not make unreasonable demands on our kids. Your kid's five years old. Don't expect them to cook supper and yell at them when they don't. We need to be reasonable. We need to, we need to discipline and instruct them in the way of the Lord because we are God's representatives. He's put us in their lives for us to train them up in the nurture and admonition of God. And we are to do nothing to discourage them. I want you to know something, and I know this for a fact, and you can read a lot of studies that prove this out. Children that are, that are properly disciplined and taken care of uh, end up loving their parents more and more and more. But kids that are abused as kids, whether it be physical or verbal or whatever way, as soon as they can, they get out of town. They don't want anything else to do with their parents. Sometimes it hurts my heart when I hear about people who don't know where their parents are, don't even know if they're living, and then they add that next phrase, don't even care. How sad is that? So we got wives, husbands, children, parents. We're in good shape. And if you're reading ahead, you're like, the next one doesn't involve me. Yes, it does. I don't want you to miss out on being an employee. You say, well, it says, it says here uh, in verse uh, 22, bond servants. Well, we all know what a bond servant is, right? A servant is somebody that's hired. They're, I mean, purchased. They're purchased and they're put to work. A bond servant is somebody who is hired. A bond servant volunteers to work and he's taken care of in some way in order to work. And in our world today, that really is a, just like an employee because whether you like it or not, you're a bond servant to wherever you work. You show up. If you show up, they pay you. If they don't pay you, you don't show up a lot of times, right? You quit showing up, amen? Okay, but you expect to be paid. They pay you. You are, in a sense, a bond servant to them. So Paul writes here three verses, actually four verses. He writes here about this subject, and he says, Bond servants obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by eye service, you know what that is, right? That's when the boss says, do something, and you roll your eyes, okay? Not as a people pleaser. I'm going to do whatever he says because I want him to like me. That's not the reason you do it, okay? But you do it with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Oh, what? I am supposed to obey my boss. I am supposed to be a good employee. I am supposed to be an employee who works, not because I'm trying to make the boss happy, not really because I'm trying to get paid, but because I am doing it with a sincerity of heart because I want to honor God. Fear the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord. We go to work, whatever we're doing, we're to do it as if we're working for God. And Paul goes on and he finishes with a couple more words, and not for men. He said, when you go to work, don't do it because that guy told you to do it or this place told you to do it or this company policy. You go to work because I'm working for Jesus on this site right here. As a Christian, go back to verse 1 where he says, I've been raised with Christ. He's talking to Christians. When you go to work, you are little Christ in a working environment, wherever it is. And he says, do it as it is hearty, heartily for the Lord. Verse 24, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance of your reward, you are seeking, uh, you are serving the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, you know what? Yeah, you'll get paid maybe, but that's the greater reward is you're serving Jesus. That's where you get your true reward. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Oh, did you ever notice that verse at the end there? Because a lot of times we just kind of skip that verse. So we go to work. Listen to me. He's writing to believers. Verse 1 makes that very clear. He's writing to believers, and we go to work, and we work for eye service, or we work to, to be a, a people pleaser, or we're working for any other agenda but besides serving the Lord, and he says we're going to stand accountable for that. It's right there, verse 25. The wrongdoer will be paid back. We're going to be held accountable. We're going to stand accountable because we worked for the wrong reason. It's right there. I didn't make it up. I want you to know this morning that your actions at work or your reactions at work make a great impact on everybody at work with you. 
And, you know, I always knew that, and I always tried very, very best to, to I mean, I worked a secular job up in 2015, and I always tried my very best to be a good testimony, or whatever. I didn't realize until after I retired, after I retired, comments and things came back to me from people I worked with. And even recently, a comment came back where somebody bumped into uh, to somebody and said, I know, uh, you know, your pastor, I know who he is, uh, and I used to work with him, and... He was a goof. He stole from the company. He cursed and carried on. He was, no. He was a good guy. We make an impact where we work. Now, there's always restrictions. I want to make sure we, we think about these as we finish this text. Obviously, when your boss tells you to do something the company doesn't approve of, you should not do that. Your boss tells you to do something that is against the law. You shouldn't do that either. And if your boss tells you to do something against the word of God, don't do that either. You say, well, if, if I don't do those things, I'll be fired. You're better off unemployed and right with God than you are with the best job in the world and away from God. And so Paul mentions three things. We need to change our direction. We need to change our living. And we need to change our practices. And so I want to finish with three things. We need to make 2023 successful by, first of all, changing. Review your life. Consider who you are this morning and see what needs to change and then do it. You know, Nike says, just do it. You say, Pastor, you know how hard this is? Yes! I've been working on it for 65 years. And in just a few weeks, I'll nail down 66. I don't want you to think this is easy for me. It's not easy for me. It's life. It's a struggle. It's a uphill battle all the time because the flesh wants to be the flesh. And yet as a Christian, go back to verse 1, been raised with Christ, I want him to be in charge of my life. And every thought process and every reaction and everything that happens, I want him in charge. But the flesh is going, now, 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 now. You're not going to have no fun if you follow Jesus, right? Have you heard that lie? Okay. Oh, how about this lie? I'm sure you've all heard this lie. You go ahead and do what you want. He'll forgive you. Is that true? It is true. But what did Paul say? Should we continue in sin? No. Change. Review your life. I, I, I can't. First of all, I'm not going to. And second of all, I can't. Look into your life and figure out what you need. I know I have a hard time looking into Jim's life and seeing what Jim needs. We need to review our life today. Not just today, but every day. Revive us, O Lord. Fill our hearts with thy love. Amen? The second thing we need to do, we need to, to be successful, is to change. The second one is to be living. Living for Jesus, a life that is true, striving to please him in all that I do. That's an old hymn. That's a phrase out of an old hymn. And it is so true. Living. Living for Jesus. The people around you, your neighbors, the people you go to the gym with, the people you, whatever you do, I don't know what you do, whatever you do, they should be able to talk about you as one who is living for Jesus. That doesn't mean you carry a great big Bible with you every place. It doesn't mean you have a nice fancy t-shirt that says, I'm a believer, or verse 1, I've been raised with Christ. It doesn't mean that. It means your attitude, your thought process, your tongue, how you respond to people, all is different than they're used to. Because the world's an ugly place. Make 2023 successful by changing, by living, and by practice. I practice. Start now. Start today. Live different. Love different. Serve different. Be different. Don't settle for what you've been. Don't settle for what you've been comfortable with. Let's be honest. Isn't our life, isn't there a comfortable place we like to sit? Even though it's not necessarily right with God, we're just like, it's just here. This is fine. And God's like, no, it's not fine. We need to practice. We need to start now. We need to live different. We need to love different. We need to serve different. We need to be different for Jesus. 
I got news for you, folks. The Lord is coming back. And the closer that time gets to us, the harder things are going to get. And if we can't make a stand now, we'll never make a stand when we really need to make a stand. Albert Einstein said, Insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. So if you think you're going to do the same thing this year that you did last year and at the end of the year you're going to stand up in church or you're going to get before God at home or whatever and say, Lord, I just thank you that I am so much different this year than I was last year. I want to tell you what's going to happen. Nothing. Nothing. Insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again hoping for a different change. It's not going to happen. We've got to change. We've got to change. We've got to get out of the rut. You know, I've told you what a rut is. A rut is a casket with the both ends knocked out. We've got to get out of the rut. We've got to start new. We've got to run hard, and we've got to finish well. And 2023 will be different. I would love for next year, on the last Sunday of the year, that people would stand up and say, Pastor, I've got to tell you, I did what Paul said. I, I honored God. I honored uh, God because of what Paul said in Colossians 3. Maybe you need to write this down and, and read it once a month. I don't know, whatever. I changed my direction. I changed my living. I changed my practices. And I got to tell you, I have had a very successful year because God honored it. Because God honored it. Heavenly Father, forgive us, Lord, for being complacent. Forgive us, Lord, for living in the flesh and liking it. Forgive us, Lord, for, for just following the same old track along and along and along and along. We're like a railroad train just clicking it off. Help us, Lord, to see that life has an end and that no matter how old we are, it may be tomorrow, it may be today, and that we need to do things in our life to make a difference, to influence and impact people for you and to honor and glorify you because we have been raised. We've been raised with you because of the work on Calvary. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I ask you right now to work in the hearts of our people. Lord, may we be a testimony, a witness of what, what happens when we surrender all to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.